All right. If you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of Luke 1 with me this morning, please. Chapter 1, Gospel of Luke. Verse number 26. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered, said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Father, I pray now that you bless this holy word as it goes out. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Gabriel answered her question that she posed in verse 34. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be? This is a biological impossibility, in plainer words. I'm totally confused. What in the world's going on here? How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Amen. Now, don't you listen to me this morning, please. What I'm going to say to you is very important because I'm going to show you something that was showed to me. While I was studying this morning and praying, God showed me something I'd never seen before. And when he did, I thought, why hadn't I seen that before? That's always the way it is. But when you do see it, Man, does it begin to open up. It's in verse number 35. This is very important, what I'm going to say. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, I believed in the virgin birth from day one. Never had a controversy about it in my soul. Never. I don't believe any Christians ever worried about the virgin birth. I believe Christians embrace that with no problem whatsoever. Once they begin to study their Bible, they know why. If you've ever read Romans chapter number 5, if you haven't, go home and read it this afternoon. Read Romans 5 and pray over it. And pray about the fact that death has come upon all men because it came from Adam who handed to us this curse that started in the garden. And that we're all sons of that first Adam. So we understand that man's in trouble. And therefore, when God sent his only begotten son into this world, he had to be virgin born. He had to be virgin born in order to not be part of the original curse. And of course, he is, was, virgin born. But how did it happen? The apostle tells you here in verse number uh, 25, is that what we're looking at? 35, he tells you how it happened. I got to look at that praying over that thing and I noticed a key to understanding this text. And that key jumped out at me and a key is a very important thing. Because if you got the key, it'll unlock the door. And once you unlock that door, you can find out what's behind it. And it not only unlocks the door, it begins to open up all kinds of different avenues to understand the scripture. The key is this. Watch this carefully. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. 
You say, what do you mean by that? That's how she became with child. Now here's the thing. You need to understand what that means. The Greek word is episkiatzo. 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 That means to cause a darkened effect by interposing something between a source of light and an object to overshadow, cast a shadow. Now that got to me to thinking. I thought, my goodness gracious, is that saying to me that there was a light that shone out of the heavens that came down from the Almighty and that light literally engulfed this virgin girl and that was that light, she being bathed in light, clothed in light, she became impregnated by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. You understand that no human agency is involved. She literally, the Son of God literally came into this world in light, in a ray of light. Say, how do you know that? Hold your place here. Now we're going to do a little Bible study with you this morning. You don't mind, do you? A little Bible study. I'm not up to preaching and stomping around all over the place, so what I'm going to do is just do the best I can do. Over here in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1, now we're going to go back and forth between these two scriptures, but I want you to look at something that God showed me. In Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 3, the Lord Jesus Christ is the, who being the brightness of his glory, in other words, the shining ray of light, the radiance coming forth out of eternity and shining down on this world onto a virgin girl, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The image is from the Greek word character. That's what that's the word. Anybody know an English word that's similar to that? <laughs> character. In Greek doesn't mean what it does in English. In English, we think of the word character as meaning personality, right? That's his character, but not in Greek. In Greek, it means an engraving, a mark, or an impression placed on an object. So the light that shines out of eternity brought one into this world who was the very impression, impressed the impression of the one who sent him. And then it says this, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now watch this. And his, the image of his person, this third word right here is so very important. Follow along with me. His person is translated from the Greek word hypostasis. This word means the essential or basic structure, the nature of an entity, the substantial nature, the essence, the actual being, the reality. Here's what it says. A light shines out of eternity. That light has the very character, the impression, the imprint, the image of the one who sent it. And the one who sent it, the word is used, hypostasis, because there's nothing better you can use to describe that invisible, eternal, almighty, absolute being that is from everlasting to everlasting that no eye can see or ever has seen. So now we have a very, a light shining. That light is the character, the image of the invisible God and that light is wrapping itself around a virgin girl. Amen. Now we got this far, okay? We got further to go. It's wrapping itself around a virgin. Pure light of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is being conveyed from heaven in that light down to the virgin. You follow me? That's where he came from. He came from that invisible realm, the third heaven, and he's coming down 
to a virgin and he's coming in the light. He's the light of the world, right? Now watch this. Go back to the book of Luke chapter number 1 verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Now watch this. And the power of the highest shall do what? Overshadow thee. Here's where it gets interesting. Very interesting. This pure light of God coming down that's wrapping itself around a virgin cannot shine upon that virgin in its full glory. She couldn't stand it. So he overshadows it. He cast a shadow between the light coming from God and the human being receiving it. This is why she is overshadowed. Now that same terminology is used back in the book of Matthew chapter 17. Same thing. Matthew 17 verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with them. Then answered Peter and said to the Lord, said unto, unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. I would say that too. Amen. Hallelujah. Find me a place. <laughs> yes, it's awful good to be up here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. Now, Peter, you're getting out of hand, son. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Wait a minute. You're putting Moses and Elijah on the same level as Christ. Big mistake, Peter. Now watch this. He meant well. This wasn't done. This is no guile in this. He meant well. He got really excited about it. Now watch this. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Same wording. Same wording. Same wording. The glory of God was coming down on his son. Just like it came down on him when he was incarnated in the womb of the virgin. Yet they couldn't stand it. So it's overshadowing them. There's a cloud between them. It's like the cleft of the rock. When Moses said, Lord, I want to see your glory. God's saying, you don't know what you're asking for. You don't have any idea what you're asking for. So, they, so he put him in the cleft of the rock. Now watch this. Behold, a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they did what? They fell on their face and were sore afraid. It's, it literally frightened them to their soul. But you see the principle. The Lord Jesus Christ could receive that light. That pure light from God is how he got here. He came down with that light shining from eternity into the invisible world. And this light comes down. And then when it comes down to the creation, even the virgin could not have all that light come upon her. So she was overshadowed. And on top of the Mount of Transfiguration, when the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified in their presence, an overshadowing takes place. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. There's something quite remarkable that takes place. Go to the book of Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. Exodus chapter number 14, verse 19. Exodus chapter number 14, verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Now watch this. It was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that one came not near the other 
all the night. This cloud is the cloud of the glory of God in the Old Testament. It is akin to this bright light shining down from heaven. This bright light that shines down from heaven on the virgin, she conceives because the Son of God is in that light. He's the light of the world. She conceives, but God has to overshadow her. He has to put a cloud between her and his glory or else she could be no more. You can't, there's not a soul in here right now that could stand before the blazing glory of God. Amen. I wouldn't dare try. And so he overshadows her. And this is what Gabriel said, that the highest shall come upon thee, the Holy Spirit, and he shall overshadow thee. Hebrews says that the light shone out of the darkness or out of eternity and that light came down and that light was the very character of God and that light was the character of his person, his essence. Does anybody in this house today have any idea what the essence of God is? You'd have to know what the essence of a spirit is, don't you? We know the Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man. And the incarnation is all about God becoming a man so he could go to a cross and die for you. It's also a fact that it is impossible for God to die. That can't happen. That cannot happen. It cannot happen. God cannot die. If he died, then who's going to uphold all things by the word of his power? It is God that holds the universe together and gives life to all that lives. Nothing could exist. Right? Right? God cannot die, but the God-man who took part of the same that we talked about this past Wednesday night, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, that I couldn't find until Debbie McLeod got me over there to it. And I'll never forget that scripture again. <laughs> Hebrews 2, 14, he took part of the same. He was incarnate in flesh. Why? Because the flesh could die on the cross at Calvary. But it couldn't die except he give himself unto the Father. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. All right, we've got light shining out of eternity. We've got a light shining out of eternity that's a beautiful, brilliant representation and manifestation of the glory of God. That light comes down upon a virgin and that virgin is impregnated because that light bears the Son of God into her womb. Her womb was literally lit up with the glory of God save for that shadowing that went over the top of her and allowed her to live. She was protected by the light. Now the light does more than protect. There's more to it than that. We just read in the Old Testament where that, that glory of God that went before the children of Israel that gave them light that illuminated their path was darkness to the enemy. It was light to the children of Israel, but it was darkness to the enemy. When the light came down upon this virgin and she was impregnated by the power of Almighty God, like no one before or after ever will be, one time, one time only, the virgin daughter of Zion, overshadowed by this power of God so that she wouldn't literally be cooked to a cinder or whatever the glory would do to her, every indication from Scripture is nobody could see that light. Nobody, nobody, especially Satan. Because in the Old Testament, the glory, the glory, this pillar of light that separated Israel from their enemies, Israel was illuminated by the light, but their enemy was darkened by the light. That enemy represents the devil. Yes, sir, it represents Satan. Don't you think, don't you think, if Satan had known when and where that God Almighty's son was born, he could have easily told Herod the Great when two years later he came to try to destroy every child from two down. Don't you think if Satan had known that that was the very son of the living God, he would have had everything he needed to do to be standing right there on the spot to do away with him? Absolutely. He could not see that glory that came down upon that virgin daughter of Zion. She was protected and he was blinded. 
The same light that lightens the path of your path toward God is the light that darkens the path for those that don't know God. The Bible is a sharp two-edged sword. On one hand it blesses and on the other hand it curses. If you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, thou art blessed, thou art blessed, thou art blessed. You reject him, you're cursed, you're cursed, you're cursed. It is both light and darkness. It is both heaven and hell. Everything is included in this book right here to tell you how to get to heaven. When you reject it, it'll, you're, it'll tell you about the road to hell. It's all included in this word of the living God. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning. I'm the ending. I'm the complete circle. Like you have in the occult world, you have a yin and a yang, which is a perversion of the truth that Christ is all and in all. Christ is everything and him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now I want to go back and I look at the incarnation and I think about God becoming flesh. God has pulled the blinders back from my eye and now I understand what went on that day with this virgin daughter of Zion. She was literally bathed in light and the light of the world came to her and that light opened her womb and that light put the Son of God in her womb and nine months later, the light of the world was born into this world. Our Lord Jesus Christ incarnate in flesh. Now why was he incarnate? What's that all about? What's the point in the incarnation? I'm going to give you two and then I'll, we'll let you go home. There's two reasons he was incarnate, and these are big reasons. Here's reason number one. Turn with me in the book of Hebrews. Let's see. Let's make it, uh, let's make it, uh, let's make it uh, Hebrews chapter number two and verse number 14. Hebrews chapter number two, verse number 14. Now watch this. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, now watch this, this is the key, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now it is impossible for God to, li to, to die, right? So God had to become flesh in order to die. The God-man died. All right. It was his death at the cross at Calvary that became the great hook that was put into the jaw of Satan because it was by death itself that he defeated the, the one who wielded the power of death. Do you understand that this world was sold into the power of Satan when Adam handed the kingdom over to him? And Satan is the God of this world. Satan has two types of power. He can enrich you and give you glory and power in this world beyond your wildest imagination. There are people right now that are so brazen and bold that they're telling the world, oh yeah, I made a league with Satan. Some of them think it's a joke, but they made a league with Satan. And it's because of that league they made with Satan that they are so famous, so rich, have everything the world can offer. But remember this, Satan is also the one who has the power of death. He can kill. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, the apostle Paul said of the man who had his father's wife, turn him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved. The Satan can kill you. He can destroy you. If you are not saved, then you are a prime target of Satan and you have no defense against him whatsoever. And if he's tired of using you, if he's used you up and has no more purpose for you, he can take you from this world just like that. But if you're born again, if you're born again, something happened when Christ died. Say, what was that? Satan's power is in death. The Lord Jesus Christ died. Satan had everything he could throw against him, he threw against him. So therefore, he used his power of death against Christ. Amen. Although the Lord offered himself up unto the Father yeah. and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, Satan exhausted his authority over the Son of God. Yeah. When he died on the cross, he used up what he could do against him yeah. 
And then on the third day when he arose from the dead, he arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Satan cannot touch him again, has no authority over him whatsoever. So when the Bible said he came to destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, the devil no longer has the power of death against a believer. If you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, before Satan can touch a hair on your head, he has to get permission from God. How do you know that? Peter, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. The apostle John says over there in 1 John, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Advocate is a term you hear lawyers use. <laughs> you ever hear a lawyer talk enough, you'll talk enough, you'll hear the term advocate, adversary. These are legal terms. So what's that mean? That means that in a legal court where Satan is the God of this world and has a right to those in this world that come under his authority and power, he can come against you and wage every accusation possible. He's the accuser of the brethren, but we have an advocate with the Father, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who will remind the devil, Satan, you've already done everything you can do, and that one is in me. And you've got to go through me to get to them. <laughs> Satan can't touch you lest he can get through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he can't get through him. Amen. So, did he just, so did the Lord Jesus Christ fail when he came here 2,000 years ago? No, he didn't fail. This is why when you're born again, you may have more baggage. You may be a drug addict. You may be a sex addict. You may be a lying, thieving dog, no down, low down, good for nothing bum. But once you're born again by the grace of God, you've got two natures from that moment on, the old man and the new man. And from that day on, the new man belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And daily by the grace of God is recreated in his image. That we might bear the image of the heavenly because we've borne the image of the earthy. That's a wonderful thing that he came so you could have victory over the flesh. That's what kills people, folks. It's the flesh. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. And the flesh is far more subtle than you give it credit for. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, everybody understands that. It's the pride of life. That's where Satan will put it to you, is the pride of life. Satan has the power of death. But in Christ Jesus the Lord, you flee to him. He's your high tower. He's your buckler. And in him, Satan cannot touch you. So the apostle John warned you in 1 John chapter number 5. He said, if you see a brother sinning a sin unto death, unto death, a brother sinning a sin unto death, that's the death of the body that's cutting the life short on this earth. And God says to the apostle over there in 1 John 5, he said, don't pray for him. If he's sinning a sin unto death, that means he's crossed the line. That means God can no longer chasten him. Hebrews chapter number 12, he can no longer deal with him as with a son. And if he can't deal with him as with a son, then he turns him over to, the, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Amen. I'm glad, thank God, if I lose my mind and go bonkers and go off the deep end, go screaming mad, and, and they have to lock me up in a, in, in, in a straight, in a, what do they call it, a straight jacket, locked up behind bars, I'm still saved. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Your battle is in your mind. The Apostle Paul says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into obedience every thought, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The battle is in the mind. It's in your mind. Day in and day out, you're fighting this battle of the mind. The mind, the old man, is lusting and fighting against the new man. And one of them wants control. He wants supreme. He wants superiority in your life. He wants to take you down. The old man is alive and well. How many agree with that? I didn't have an old man until 1973 when I got a new man. <laughs> Once I got a new man, I had an old man. And I realized I had a battle going on. Never fought that battle before. All I was was the old man before. Once God saved my soul, the battle began to rage like you wouldn't believe. The incarnation is to give you victory over the old man. And here's the last reason for the incarnation. 
And this is a blessed thing. In Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. You see now why Jews hate him? The Apostle Paul calls the law a curse. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Now in the Bible, curse is not like curse out here in the world. For the most part, most people, when they use the word curse, they think it's something you say, right? People blaspheme. And you hear a lot of that today, in your face with it. But in the Bible, curse has far, far, far deeper meaning than simply what you say. In the Bible, curse has to do with your station, your place, your life, your future, your hope, what you are. Because in the Bible, if you are cursed, that means nobody can do anything to change that curse. That curse is on you. You're stuck with it. And you're going into a Christless eternity without God and without hope. But the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ became a curse for us. He was cursed of God. When he went to the cross, God Almighty brought the curse down on his son. Not only was the Lord Jesus made sin for us who knew no sin, not only was God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, but the Bible says that Christ, when he went to the cross, was made a curse for us. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Look at, look at Absalom in the Old Testament. Absalom. How did he die? He was hanging on a tree. Caught between the bow of an oak and his hair was caught up there. There's some speculation. If it, some, some say it was his hair. He was literally hanging by his hair. Some seem to think that he was, his neck was high enough where he was caught between branches. And there he was hanging. It didn't make a difference one way or the other. He's hanging on a tree. He's cursed. So how can you lift the curse? By taking the curse and putting it on one and that one becomes the curse of all humanity. He died for all. If all are dead, Christ died for all. He becomes the curse itself. Then he's laid in a tomb. And the one who had the power of death through everything he could against the one who came into this world in a ray of light and wrapped himself around a virgin's womb and then had to put a shadow over her because she couldn't stand the full glory of God. He hung on a tree suspended between heaven and earth and said, Father, it's finished. And there when he finished it, your curse was finished. My curse was finished. And here's what happens. The Bible says, Numbers chapter number 23, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the Spirit of the law of liberty and life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The Lord Jesus Christ gives you life. You can't be cursed. And all I ask you to do today, and all that God asks you to do, yeah. is to acknowledge that you need Him yeah. and acknowledge the truth about yourself. Amen. I told my wife the other day, I said, if this book it, uh, says anything, it's got us pegged. Amen. It has read my title clear. I start reading the Bible and I'll find myself in there 500 times before I get through four or five books in the people that it mentions. And I think, good night, man. I'm just like that. I've done what they've done. Why? Well, the Bible has got your number. <laughs> That's why men don't want to read it. It's got you. It's got you. How many agree with that? The book's got us, folks. But it's not written to condemn you. These things are written that you might believe. Hallelujah to God. That's the good thing about it. The Bible's not written to send you to hell. The Bible's written to save you. <laughs> that's the good thing about it. And I guess that's why the old timers used to call it the good book. Who's ever heard it called the good book? <laughs> it's the good book. Because it's about the good God. And our great Savior. So all God's asking you to do today is to, as the old timers used to say, fess up. You ever, how many of you ever heard that fess up? Amen. 
Fess up, man. Come before God and say, you've told the truth about me. You're telling the truth. I am what you said I am. No, no, you know, no excuses. I'm not hiding behind the church. I'm not hiding behind the hypocrite. I'm not hiding behind. I am what you said I am. Lord, have mercy on my soul. And he'll have mercy on your soul. That's what this book's about. That's what that message is about. That's what that light was about when it wrapped itself around that little virgin. I don't even think that Joseph saw that light. No, I don't think any human being saw that light. No, sir. I don't think, I don't think anybody's going to see the face of God until he gets ready to make himself known to us. But boy, when he does, it'll all be worth it. Somebody said to me the other day, say, Preacher, when I get to heaven, I've got a list this long of questions for God. I mean, i got me a list, but it keeps getting longer every day. Yeah. All these things I don't understand, stuff's happening in my life, I can't explain this and that, blah, blah, and so forth and so on. I said to them, when you get to heaven, it won't matter. It won't matter. It won't matter. I'll ask you one question and I'll shut up. How many things that you thought were so important and mattered didn't matter anymore when you got saved. Amen. Didn't matter anymore. <laughs> didn't matter anymore. <laughs> That's the way it'll be when you get to glory. Won't matter. When we see him as he is, it won't matter. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you'd use what I've said, and I thank you, Lord, for what you've given me. I pray somehow or another I got it across to the people. It'll be a blessing to them. Our Father, I believe in the incarnation. I believe in the virgin birth. Lord, you know that. I believe it. I believe it in my soul. And Father, I pray that you'd bless through your word and save that one heavenly Father today that's willing to come, come to thee just as they are, just as they are. Sinner, guilty, condemned. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.